Today we are talking about radiation safety and waste management in the radio pharmacy. It's the second time I'm recording this because during the actual class my dogs went crazy in the background. So yeah, let's see how it goes. It's it's a shortish lecture, also 30 minutes, and some ideas and comments that you can take into consideration. So occupational exposure in the radio pharmacy can be reduced by having the essential protection, of course. Also take into account that your physical dosimeters is not originally designed specifically for the radio pharmacy, but you should wear them correctly, interpret the data correctly, and always have it on you. You should give consideration to finger and eye doses and not just only worry about the whole body dose. And there's some endless scenarios in the radio pharmacy that can happen. We cannot cover them all in one lecture and you should always be logical, think and be aware. So the fundamental principles of being allowed to work with radio pharmaceuticals is justification, optimization and dose limits. So always keep in mind that you have to justify what you are doing is important and is useful. You should optimize the way you work and also focus on your dose and dose limits. Wear that electronic dosimeter, especially if you are not well aware or that well trained of what you do. You should definitely have an electronic dosimeter to make you aware of all the ways you can get exposure in the radio pharmacy. Sometimes just walking past a, a waste container that is not emptied well enough and your electronic dosimeter goes off can go a long way in teaching you how to work correctly with radioactivity. This is just a funny way to say what's the difference between the units of radiation that we work with. So Becquerel is just how much radioactivity you have. Gray is how much of this radioactivity will be given to you as a dose on your body. But this doesn't say what is the outcome of that. So this goes into sieverts. So that is mainly giving you an idea of the biological effect. So if you get the same gray from different radioactivity, it doesn't mean you will have the same sieverts. There is different exposure situations. The one you plan, you know, you're going to radio label in the radio pharmacy. That's when you know about the constraints and the technicalities and, and what you are dealing with. An emergency exposure is, of course, if something happens that is unplanned. And an existing exposure is something that is always there and a decision on control has to be taken. So in that case, I would say if you have a generator in your radio pharmacy, it's standing there, it's always giving off some radiation and you have a decision on how to control it by covering it with the correct shielding, making sure nobody's there in the radio pharmacy when they are not needed, or even waste is in the radio pharmacy, radioactive waste is also an existing exposure that can be there all the time, but the decision to remove it and control it and store it somewhere else safer is important. We will get back to measurement of background radiation, but that's also really important in the radio pharmacy. The ALARA principle is for me personally more important than the accepted dose limits because it feels to me sometimes in the regular practice the dose limits are, are really advocated and spread around and made important but ALARA is forgotten. So always as low as reasonably achievable and you should always be able to motivate why something is being done. and not focus on the whole allowed whole body effective dose or allowed skin dose. I think it's needless to say that if somebody gets 20 millisieverts during a year, something is being done wrong. And of course it should never be more than that. But to say, oh, you can work until 20 millisieverts and you will be fine. I think that's the wrong attitude in my opinion. And I feel really strongly about that. So if there is not enough late shielding, if there's not enough syringe shields, if there's not trolleys to carry the radioactivity, if the L blocks are not thick enough, if there is waste standing around, even though you don't reach, reach 20 millisieverts, there is wrong with your practice. So please keep all of this in mind. Measuring exposure. So you should be wearing a ring dosimeter in the radio pharmacy for sure, always. 
it should be correctly worn on the dominant hand index finger dosimeter facing inwards your thermoluminescent dosimeter should be worn at chest level don't put it on a lanyard letting it hang below your belly or whatever it should be worn at chest level to calculate the correct amount like we said before these dosimeters were not designed for what we are necessarily 100% tailor made for radio pharmacy or working with radio uh, gamma emitters and PET isotopes so a lot of the calculations and the data that we extract from them comes from the correct placement of the body so we do some physical calculations and figuring out what you have been working with and if you wear it at the wrong place your levels will be incorrect and then electronic dosimeters gives you alarm when there is high activity and also makes you aware of where you get exposed and how you work area monitoring is very important and here i add a personal dosimeter so if you don't have access to really constant measuring devices measuring the air or all of that you can just add a normal dosimeter in the pharmacy make it a research one leave it there and then after the month when you submit it you just get the average exposure in the pharmacy and you know how much of radiation background there is also handheld um, Geiger counters is important for measuring um, contamination of people going out of the pharmacy but also the surfaces and all of the areas and this should be done regularly this should be a person checking it once a day at least or after people have worked and everybody should monitor them after they have worked now sometimes it feels like you don't want to check because you're afraid that you will be picked up as somebody that works badly or so on i think at this point you should realize that that is the least of your worries you should be safe it's your health so whatever anybody else think you should be actually even more critical of yourself than anybody else and measure yourself decontaminate yourself and learn from your mistakes surface monitoring is also important wipe testing it should be done because if you finish working even in the laminar airflow there is some, some contamination and it's not being picked up the chances increase that somebody else will come after you do a different procedure contaminate themselves and walk out without knowing that and spreading radioactivity around so that's also really important just a quick note about the ionizing and non-ionizing radiation so we are really working with ionizing radiation that changes um, have interaction with matter and this is why it's so dangerous so yeah definitely 5g cell phones is in the radio area non-ionizing so little energy doesn't make any problems for your health but we are working in the spectrum of really much more dangerous so we have to be more careful different types of radiation has different characteristics different protection measures of course your alpha emitter can be stopped by paper doesn't need shielding it's not dangerous from uh, external exposure um, side of things but once you ingest it it can be lethal the beta emitter it's also giving off um, a bit higher linear energy transfer travel further but can be stopped by alumina aluminium sorry and then of course lead is needed for your gamma emitters and then your neutrons of course concrete that's why all of these reactors using neutrons are in pools and concrete situations and also your cyclotrons and so forth gamma emission travels far can be imaged by cam cameras not that high energy but pet exposure is a, a, a maybe a bit of a bigger issue than working with normal spec isotopes like technetium so you need to be careful and i just wanted to also show you that different pet isotopes have different um, positron energies so yes your photon energies of your pet isotopes are always the same but the energy that the decay happens with is different so they are also some more dangerous than others so if you can see here that your gallium 68 is one of the ones with the 
highest mean energy and of course give you more radiation than for instance working with fluorine and also is a higher risk on your eye compared to fluorine 18 and carbon 11 and so forth so you need to know the exact characteristics of the pet radionuclide that you work with but it's safe to say you have to be extra careful with gallium compared to fluorine 18 actually just be careful with everything but please be safe, especially for gallium when you work with generators and all of these extra things and you tend to be more exposed with gallium also um, amount of time and then also this positron energy and all of this um, extra stuff. So yeah, labeling gallium with a generator and kit valves, it's I think one of the more dangerous procedures that you can do in the radio pharmacy. I just created this picture to show you where they found in the radio pharmacy that you, oh, sorry, in the nuclear medicine practice that you have the most exposure as a technologist. So, yes, radio pharmaceutical manufacturing, dose dispensing, and dose administration are areas where you get like medium exposure, but the most exposure happens when you help the patient after they have been injected to the toilet um the pre preparation of the patient and the setup on the camera when they are removed from the camera and when they are discharged so remember your patient is radioactive and you should really be careful so be careful in the radio pharmacy be even more careful when you handle your patient beta minus emission doesn't penetrate that much through skin although some of them do also give photons out that is useful for imaging so it's a balancing act but it's really dangerous during skin contamination ingestion injection and inhalation alpha particles not dangerous on the outside very dangerous on the inside so for alpha particles the shielding is less important but you need to work carefully do not spill do not make droplets do not make anything that you can inhale always change your gloves constantly so that you don't um, contaminate your hands and then later ingest it in any way. Important to know that there is sto has stochastic effects and deterministic effects. Um, deterministic is having a threshold dose and is dose dependent. So this is like the acute effects of radiation, like the burns, radiation sickness and all of that. But stochastic effects happen on a long term and it's, it's, um, there is no threshold dose. So the more you are exposed, of course, the more you have an incidence of these effects that can happen. So you need to constantly be aware of what you're working with. Okay, so what can you do? So I've made you scared. Let, let's check on how to work safely. And I have to say, I'm one of the people that are really not a high risk taker. So I would not be a radio pharmacist if this was a problem. You can with all the correct measures, have so little exposure that it's really not something to factor in. Always manage your time. Spend as less time as possible near sources of radioactivity. Spend as be as far away as feasible. Have all the shielding you need and insist on it. And also the dose. I add not always added in references but only work with the activity you need so if you have more activity don't label with more put it behind shielding put it in your waste containers always put away all your activity and only work with as much as needed distance so the amount of exposure is inversely proportional to the square of the distance so if you double the distance you reduce the radiation exposure to a quarter this can really add up so that's why we work with tweezers that's why we um, do not carry things with our hands not even if you quickly want to do something rather get as long tweezers as possible and um, also stand as far away from radioactivity as you can it's really important that if you are doing a procedure that has an incubation time don't stand next to the generator or next to your radioactivity while you watch it incubate rather go stand far away or even in the next room until this time is done shielding so those calibrators um 
have a thicker shielding. So this here I said for gallium or pet isotopes, you should have thicker shielding around your dose calibrators than when you use for spec isotopes. And for pet, you should use tungsten syringe shields instead of normal lead ones that you could use for, for technetium. So just be aware of the different shielding requirements for pet and spec isotopes. Also L blocks. So ship always all your waste to the proper areas. Maybe have a separate area in a bunker away from everybody else where you take all your waste. Often I see in radio pharmacies that there is waste containers where radioactive liquid waste are put or radioactive vials are put and kept until somebody has time to go put it somewhere else. These should be properly shielded by lead or it should just be removed as often as you can and maybe even daily. Use uh, cars to transport doses, use syringe carriers, all of these add up, and you should also shield the weight loss of the patients. Brain strolling is really important. I'm not going to go into depth with this, but if you work with lutetium, uh, any beta minus emitters like iodine 131, lutetium 177, and all of that, you should m make a point of understanding brain strolling. So for beta minus emitters, you should have first perspex shielding before you have your lead shielding, because if you sh uh, shield these beta minus emitters with lead, you will actually increase your radiation exposure substantially. So even though you want to do the right thing and put in lead shielding, you should rather put in perspex first and lead shielding and make it safer for you. Also note that radio uh, nuclides have different shielding requirements so i just put this here and you can see for a pet isotope your requirements is a uh, double 0 0.41 centimeter and then um, for technetium it's only 0 0.03 centimeter so half value thickness is actually the value of lead that makes your exposure half of what it should be if it's not shielded I have a practical example here. So at the facility where I work, there were not proper syringe shields for the injection of gallium. And then we got some, and you can see that all of the technicians exposure reduced by at least half or there was 34% or 9%, but it really made a difference in everybody's exposure of their hands. This is just extremity exposure. Also have these nice syringe carriers and also the pigs. All of this makes a difference. The time, so just be as, as quick as possible without taking risks. Possibly practice your synthesis methods without radioactivity just to get your hands trained properly. Also, uh, before you do the actual radioactive procedures, practice, of course, makes perfect. And you can always see that the exposure of people that are very well trained in the radio pharmacy is much lower than people that are just starting out. That's, that's how it works. Maybe spend as little time with your radioactive patient and also insert your IV access butterflies before you inject. This was another study that you can have a look at where they also figured out where technicians get the most radiation exposure, and it was here during injection. This is another study that you can have a look at, and you can also see where 32% of the exposure of the people in the department was during injection again. And here is just to substantiate what I said before, so this was just taking um, interoperator variances during light radio labeling and the amount of exposure gotten per procedure. And it's clear that the technician with five years of experience got the lowest um, exposure, whereas the person starting out now with just six months training got more, well, more or less double that. So yeah, definitely practice makes perfect. Only draw the amount of radioactivity needed. Discard the rest as waste. Only label with the amount of activity needed. Be careful of fresh generators. Um, and here I was talking much more about the gallium 68 or germanium 68 generators because the amount of radioactivity you get um, during the first month of these generators shelf life is really high and, and quite dangerous. Whereas later on, 
when it, when the generator is a bit flatter, it's it's much better for your radiation protection. Do not buy stronger molybdenum or germanium generators if you only need less, and always store unused activity behind lead and discard as soon as possible and remove that waste out of your facility. Be careful of your eyes. So. Um, the eyes is those dependent so if you get a single high exposure this will lead to cataract formation and you should um, always be aware of that i just have some examples here and it is very often very feasible to get higher exposure on your eyes when labeling gallium than than what is suggested so be careful and then I think my final discussion will be about waste management. So the radio pharmacy has uh, different types of waste. It makes it really difficult to control. There is the liquid waste, the solid waste. With your personal protective uh, equipment, you have biological waste if you radio label cells. You have also radioactive sources and generators and some decayed ones as well. And then you also have your non-radioactive chemical waste, your non-radioactive PPE. And then all of this should also be split up in short, medium and long lived waste. So your radioactive waste should be split up in short, medium and long lived so that you know whenever they turn into non-radioactive waste or at the levels where they can be considered as such that you can discard of it easily. So Radioactive waste management in the radio pharmacy is quite a, a task and there should definitely be somebody taking responsibility for this and knowing exactly how to and when to dispose of these. Very important is to note that germanium 68 from your germanium generator is classified as long-lived waste and has to be kept up to 10 years. So if you have a bad performing generator, which can happen with illusion of the parent isotope out of the generator system it can really lead to expensive storage so you should make sure that your generators that you receive are monitored for germanium 68 and then if there is any malfunction they should be shipped back to your manufacturer again remove waste regularly i think i've said it like so many times in this video but when you label with Gallium, for instance, there is the liquid waste from the automated unit, all of the elements that is not used, there is cassettes, purification cartridges, all generators. So you label them as if they are long lived with the parent isotope, you monitor them after a few days and see if they, is, they are still radioactive. If they are still radioactive, they are contaminated with this long lived isotope, you label them by date and you go store them in your separate room or bunker, preferably maybe on the lower ground of the facility where you work and yeah this is really quite a daunting task that i've been faced with many many times in my life germanium waste is a real problem and there is some really breakthrough percentages if your generators get older so just just to show you that there is really quite the germanium breakthrough if you are in the radio pharmacy and you do label and there is some contamination, you have to be aware of all the procedures. If it's a person, remove their clothes, bag it, wash off and have a sh uh, shave if there's areas of hair that is contaminated or cut. I mean, if you cannot remove the, the, the radioactivity and they are really there is a need to be decontaminated if it's an area you clean from the outwards outside inwards you use your spill kit you have to evaluate risk versus benefit if it's a short-lived isotope like gallium 68 you can possibly close off the lab till the next day and it will have decayed by itself all unnecessary people should be removed from the area and you should require ppe personal uh, protective equipment that you would wear while you assist there is different types of contamination. So a source from the outside, like a spill, can irradiate you. So you have to remove yourself from the area or remove the source. You can be contaminated um, on the body surface. This can be loosed or fixed. 
Loose particles is also a problematic sometimes because if you have loose contamination, it floats around, it spreads, it can go anywhere, also through your ventilation systems and so forth. Fixed activity is on a surface and then that's difficult to remove sometimes as well. Should be careful of ingestion and inhalation. Of course, getting injected by a radio pharmaceutical puts the radioactivity inside you and then also wounds can be contaminated. So if you have an accident which involves some sort of an injury as well as some um, contamination, you really have to make sure that you didn't get exposed too much and that it's dealt with properly. I would strongly recommend that everybody has a spill kit in their radio pharmacies where they work or even in their nuclear medicine departments. It's a really nice thing to have a box packed with all the things that you would need during an event so that you don't need to scramble around and grab for stuff. So this is really one of the most easiest things to have. Somebody needs to check it often and if you use it, just replace everything and it really makes all the difference. And then, of course, you would have to have the correct signs in your department. So, bad examples I've seen in practice, just to make you aware of, of some major bad examples. Of course, like we said, handling your radioactive patients. So, a lot of technologists are really caring. Talk to their patients, stand close to them, listen to them, spend some time with them, make them feel better. But this is then also not good for yourself. Lots of people try to take their phones into the radio pharmacy and that's of course really bad. Um, you can contaminate your phone, take it out with you and not even think twice about it. Waste that is not stored. Well, these are behind lead shielding, but it's not marked properly. It's not removed as it should. And this is also not contained. So it should be closed off so that it doesn't um, become loose particle contamination in the air. And another thing that I've seen is maybe if the, the ward is really busy and there's not a lot of space, then sometimes they will park a patient somewhere. I'm not saying, I think it's bad practice in general, but if it's a radioactive patient, of course, then they are also irradiating everybody around them. So not good practices. So just as a summary, know your radiation sources, know how they irradiate you, know how to work with them, know how to shield them properly, know what you intend to do, how to do it, practice it beforehand with, with cold techniques, make sure that you are really trained in doing it properly, correctly, and as quickly as possible. The environment should be really monitored and controlled, and waste should be moved often, and also contamination should be checked as well. The time and frequency of what you do should be known and also monitored that you don't do too high volume of work. If there is alternatives to use for the procedures that you do, look at that. Also alternative methods, so if you've been radio labeling with kids, that's all good and well, but if you can get automation going, that's also even better. And then you have to have precautions in place, like the tweezers, the or serene shields, the PPE, and all of that.